So my husband, Jason, has a pretty hairy chest. And do you remember that one Austin Powers movie where Kristen Johnson's character, Ivana Humpsalot, rips open his shirt and she says, oh, you are hairy, like animal. I probably recite that line to my husband at least once a month. And so we got the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0, and it has their lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, which Jason said is more gentle and trims better than any other ear and nose trimmer he's ever used before. Those were his exact words. And several other amazing products. But the lawnmower 4.0 features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. This fourth generation trimmer is waterproof and also has an LED spotlight. And he said he appreciates that because the lighting in our shower isn't the greatest. Manscaped just launched their new Boxers 2.0 that are packed with features, including the Jewel Pouch, which is designed to cradle his boys in their own special space. So whether he's mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, or golfing in the sun, these moisture-wicking boxers breathe without breaking a sweat. Quick story. So my husband used to go to this gym where he came home one time and he told me that in the locker room, there was this older gentleman that had was naked and he had leaned up against the counter and was washing his balls in the sink. So ever since then, we kind of joke about it. And I mean, maybe if this man had these boxers, he wouldn't feel the need to do that. But anyway, get 20% off and free shipping with the code NOISE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code NOISE. My husband loved it. It's a great gift for any man in your life, whether or not he's hairy like an animal. The answers are within you not outside anybody, not with your friends. It's it's really within you. And so many of us abandon ourselves when we're going through this kind of loss. You're listening to Make Some Noise Podcast, episode number 458 with guest, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm so glad that you're here. I am gearing up to go out to Boulder, Colorado for a week to work on a new project for you. I am doing a project with Sounds True, and it's going to be an inner critic audio workshop that comes out next year in 2023. Depending on when you're listening to this, you might be listening to it, and it's the future, and it's already out. I can't reveal the title because it might change, (laughs) but it's all about negative self-talk, all about your inner critic. There's going to be shame work in there. I I had no no intention of talking about it this much, um, but I'm I'm headed out there to work on it and I'm really excited. I've never done a project like this with a publisher where there's no actual book involved, but I really like to talk. So I think it's going to be great, especially for those of you who really enjoy the audio um, platform medium. What is it called? Can't think of the word. I think it's going to be, it's going to be really great. And this probably won't be the the last time I talk about this, but sounds true was the very first sort of, you know, personal development publisher, if you will, that I used to get their catalog, the actual like paper catalog. And it was right when I was going through my divorce, my really difficult, one of the most difficult times of my life. And I was diving in to personal development. And they had, this was back when things were still on disc on like CD and you would put the CDs in your car. I think I, I think I downloaded some of them to my iPod. That was, that was one of the options. But anyway, it feels amazing and full circle to be here now um and signing a contract with sounds true and and off to boulder to to work with them to put out my own work. So dreams do come true, everyone. Dreams do come true. I am excited to introduce you to today's guest as we round out the relationships theme here on the show. I wanted to have someone on who specialized in divorce. And before you turn this off, we we aren't just talking about divorce. Everything that that Dr. Cohen talks about can be applied to if you have gone through 
uh, a friendship breakup, if you have gone through the loss of a job, some kind of loss in your life that might make you feel angry, might make you feel you know, have some grief, some resentment. We definitely touch on on all of those, and you know, believing in your ability to heal. I just it, we we, are, we run the gamut of of different topics around this type of situation slash challenge in your life. Um, before I forget, we have a just a couple of spots left for the retreat in Asheville, North Carolina, the Daring Way retreat that I am hosting. I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before. Everything's included. You just need to get your cute booty to Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, even the uh, the place that we're staying, the venue is not far from the airport. And it's uh, maxing it out at 12 women. And we're going to go through the daring way, which is basically the steps of shame resilience, like how to incorporate shame resilience in your life. Like if you liked how to stop feeling like shit and that resonated with you, my, my second book, this retreat is for you because that book was born from this methodology that I teach um, with the, uh, the daring way. Okay. AndreaOwen.com slash retreat. Again, there are a couple of spots left. And I hope to see you there. So Elizabeth Cohen, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen is here today. And I loved this conversation with her. I know that you will love her. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Cohen received her PhD in clinical psychology from Boston University. As part of her graduate training, she treated clients at the world-renowned Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders in Boston, Massachusetts. She is widely considered one of New York City's experts in CBT theory and techniques. Dr. Cohen has been featured in The Wall Street Journal, NBC News, Women's Health, HuffPost, Thrive Global, and Good Housekeeping. So without further ado, here is Dr. Cohen. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Andrea, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm I'm happy for so many reasons. First of all, we share a mutual friend, and that is Kate Anthony. And my my audience is familiar with Kate. Most likely, she's been on several times. Mm. And I am. We have a theme of relationships on the podcast right now, and I wanted to make sure that we talked, you know, to the single women, that we talked to the married women, and and I am excited to have you on because you specifically. Your specialty, if if that's a, a right word, is that you help women who uh, have gone through a divorce, who are going through a divorce, and I I don't want people to turn it off if they've never gone through a divorce or they're they're happily in a relationship, but I think all of us have been through a life changing breakup of some sort, even even the loss of a job, which can sometimes kick up the feeling and emotion and experience of anger. So I'd like to start there. So I know that you help women process their own anger following a life-changing challenge like divorce, breakup, loss of job. So can you, can you talk about that for a minute? Absolutely. Um, so I think it's really important that we start with the premise that all feelings are acceptable. Yes. That if we didn't, right. If we didn't have the whole range of feelings, we wouldn't be able to have any. So many people try to kind of put in a box, um, anger, shame, resentment, guilt, um, sadness as like the negative emotions that we never want to have, but are so excited to have excitement, joy, bliss, passion. Mm -hmm. And the truth is we can't have any feeling unless we accept them all. So, you know, this is especially true when you're going through a difficult ending and, you know, the book I wrote about divorce can be applied to any sort of ending, any sort of loss, um, where we really either there's like kind of two ways I see in my clinical practice as well of either throwing yourself only into the positive, you know, um, finding a new relationship right away, trying to get another job, like really just trying to, you know, follow your bliss in a, in a, what I think in a more pathological way mm -hmm. or a ruminating and staying in the negative painful emotions. And the truth is that we're not really meant, our body isn't meant to stay in any emotion for very long. Um, there are research studies that show that if people are asked to purely sit with an emotion and not do what we do, which is um, put ourselves down for it, try to change it, rationalize it, they last, and you look at an MRI for 90 seconds, the excitation. I've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. 
And so it's really a powerful reminder that it's not about not feeling the feeling. It's about allowing it to move through you. And I think anger in particular for women is a really difficult emotion to connect to. And, a, and especially in my, in my experience, um, a, a, I would say at least 70%, maybe of the women that I've worked with, they weren't the one who wanted the ending of the relationship or the ending of the job. Right. So it kind of felt as if it quote unquote, like happened to them. Mm -hmm. And so, and then also the people who chose to end the relationship or chose to end the job, they also don't feel like they should have any right to the anger, but actually everyone has every right to every feeling. So the way I, I first start by teaching people that it's okay to have our feelings and to really talk about what anger feels like in our body. In the book, I have a, you know, kind of a stick figure and talking about, okay, let's go through the feelings and, and where do you feel that? Because we know there's no disconnect between the mind and the body. So we hold our anger or as we say in trauma therapy, our fight response in different parts of our body. And it's really important to connect to it so that we can release it. And the way that I have found most helpful for my clients and in my own experience is to do some sort of movement. So for me, when I'm feeling angry and I need um, a release, I put on, there's a couple of songs that I use. One is a song by Rage Against the Machine that oh, I put on. <laughs> love that. <laughs> Which one is it? Is it Bulls on Parade? No, it's... um. Killing in the name of killing. I mean, I knew it was either one of those two. It's so <laughs> yeah. good. And it's like on my plate. I had like a, ra- I mean, I, I have a rage playlist. I have a sadness playlist. I have a grief playlist. Like I have all these playlists. I have because- those too. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Because for what me- is called emo? I have one just labeled emo. <laughs> uh, it's so good. Right. Because there's something about music that for me, and I think for a lot of people that gets us right into our body and gets us out of our head and, and, you know, we can say that we're feeling something in a co- kind of cognitive way, but as far as feeling it, that's where the processing happens. So that's what I recommend in my book. That's what I recommend to people. And then when I'm, you know, if I'm working and I'm feeling angry and I can't do that, I often do some um, kind of pressing of my heels against my chair, which is um, a physiological ability to release some, some anger. So the heels of my um, feet and the heels of my hands and just kind of push them down. Um, so your muscles tighten and then release. And so I'm really consciously noticing when emotions come so that I can move them through because it's not like these emotions ever go away. The question is just how we manage them. Yes. I want to just note to my listeners that that's this, I know you word it differently than I do, but this is the same advice that I've given in my books and every other expert that's come on here. So if you're, if you're resisting I'm I'm pretty sure that there's like no other there's no other exercises. So you there it is. <laughs> so like, the consensus yeah. says, <laughs> and I know it's hard. I mean, I just want to yeah. say that if you've never done that before, it can be hard. So one thing I recommend to my clients is, can we do this one molecule at a time? So yes. can you play one bar of that song and then shut it down for the day and do it two bars tomorrow? Like mm-hmm. really slow and steady. This is a, just like if you were going back to the gym after a long time, like this is building a new muscle. So it's going to be hard in the beginning and you just slowly move through it. And I find being in community is really helpful. So having yes. an accountability partner, having podcasts like yours, like Kate's, I have podcasts, you know, where people are talking about this, keep leaning into those communities because it'll feel more comfortable and easier to start doing those exercises. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. And I'm glad you added that, that last part, because I always have to remember that I, I feel like I'm a little bit of, of a, of an, an outlier. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me, maybe I'm wrong. My personality, I'm an eight on the Enneagram. Um, I'm an Aries I'm a fire sign. So I've never really struggled to be able to access my anger. Mm. Definitely had some issues with feeling wrong for it. Um, you know, people telling me, why are you so angry? You know, like, mm-hmm, she, mm-hmm. Angry women, people tend to not like angry women, mm-hmm. but, but at any rate, like I, it's not hard for me to access it and process it and feel it and just like, let it move through and also emote in that way mm-hmm. and be de- demonstrative, I should say. 
And when I went through my divorce, that was one of the things that I, I did. I would, I worked at the American council on exercise and I was lucky enough. Well, it was an exercise company. There was a gym at the, at the office mm-hmm. and I would work late on purpose so that everyone would be gone or most people would be gone. At least no one was in the gym. It was a small gym. It was only a couple of treadmills and I'd get on the treadmill and I would have my angry playlist. I also had a handful of nine inch nails songs on there mm-hmm. and That's I would run job. so hard mm-hmm. and until like my legs felt like they were going to, which maybe isn't it's like, don't abuse your body. Don't do what I did. But I felt like my legs would collapse underneath me. And I would also, and then on my way home, I would also scream in the car. Mm -hmm. This Mm -hmm. was not an everyday occurrence, everyone. I mean, this was like on the bad days, but I do think that that really, really helped a lot. And then I I also want to mention that again, I don't know if everyone can even get to the point where they feel like, am I really angry about this? Like I've had, and maybe that's a question for you. Cause I've had women come to me and say, I don't even know what I'm feeling sometimes. Like I'm going through this challenging time and I don't even know what I'm feeling. So what would be your advice for that? First, I would say, if someone came to me and said that, I would say, well, your body knows that right now, maybe it's not the right time to feel the feelings. Like I would really honor when someone comes to you and says, I'm not feeling my feelings, Mm -hmm. any feelings, because there's so much pressure. Well, well, we're not supposed to feel some feelings, you know, people like, how are you feeling? You know, like when you go through a breakup or end of a job and sometimes the answer is I'm numb or I'm frozen, yes. which, which mm-hmm. is a physiological state of dealing with a trauma. We have fight, mm-hmm. flight, freeze and fawn. And so I would really honor that. Um, I am not a therapist who is interested in pull, convincing someone that they should feel something. I'm interested in walking on the journey with you. So let's talk about the freeze. What does it feel like to have no feelings? Uh, Do you have sensation? Is there parts of your body that feel numb? Mm -hmm. Do you have sensations that surprise you? Like I would really like lean into the not having any feelings instead of prescribing something to have feelings. Exactly. Yes. I wholeheartedly agree. And it's that feeling of stuckness and and you're not you're not wrong for it. You you are where you are. Exactly. Um, one of the things that I've I've repeated here on the podcast, and I'm I'm going to repeat it again because I feel like there's always someone new that needs to hear it. One thing I've taught my children that I was never taught was, and I've told them this since they were little: none of your feelings are wrong. You are you have permission in this house to feel whatever it is that you feel. You're allowed to be angry with me. You're going to be angry with me. So like I, I use that as an example for them. And then I follow that up with the thing you're that you are responsible for is your behavior based on whatever feeling it is. So, you know, no name calling, no door slamming, et cetera, et cetera. And if you do any of those things, you know, I've taught them to quote unquote, clean up your mess. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I look at it like, like any other accidental mess in the house. If you spill your cheese, it's everywhere. You're responsible for cleaning it up. And it's very similar here. So, and I, and I don't think that we, it's not just something for children. I think there's lots of adults that need to hear that, to have permission to feel their feelings and none of them are wrong. Oh my gosh. I mean, in fact, I think, first of all, it's beautiful that you give that gift to your children. I think adults more than children, because children have the beauty of being uninhibited right. um, and not, not having been you know, acculturated and um, taught that you're not supposed to have feelings. I mean, most of the people that we work with in my clinic and that I work with for the, my divorce work, is is just really connecting them to the permission, as you just said, to have have multiple feelings. I mean, first of all, to have one feeling and then to have two feelings at one time that might contradict. Mm-hmm, you know, exactly. that is like you you probably feel anger and sadness, right? Or mm-hmm. you feel you know grief and joy. That was a huge thing that was happening during the pandemic, was the allowing people to have two feelings at one time. Yeah, exactly. I'm interrupting this conversation to bring you a few words from some of our sponsors. One of my favorite things is getting my nails done, and I love doing that with my daughter, Sydney. However, that can get very expensive, and we don't get to sit together at the salon. So I started using the Olive and June Manny system, and Sydney uses their press-on nails, and we get to spend time together. I save money, and we have great nails. So Olive and June has everything you need for a salon-quality manicure in one box. You can customize it with your choice of six polishes. I prefer my signature black and darker colors, but I've been playing around with some fun colors because it's spring. 
Their polish doesn't chip and last seven days or more. I get almost two weeks out of it personally, and it breaks down to just $2 a manicure. I never thought I could get a salon looking manicure at home and I stopped attempting to do so (laughs) years ago. And even the very first time I used Olive and June's Manny system, I was floored with how good it looks. And now after a few times, I can't tell the difference between when I do them with their system and when I used to get them done at the salon. Visit oliveandjune.com slash noise for 20% off your first Manny system. That's O-L-I-V-E. A-N-D-J-U-N-E dot com slash noise for 20% off your first Manny system. For those of you that read my last book, you know that I dedicated an entire chapter to pleasure and how making time for it is so important. That's why I want to invite you to escape into a world where pleasure is your only priority because on Dipsy, you can find stories that match your mood. So Dipsy is an app. I have it on my phone and my iPad. It's full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. You can find stories about that intriguing coworker that has a British accent. I personally like the one with the Irish accent. You can filter and find it. Or hooking up with your yoga instructor. They bring scenarios to life with immersive characters, no matter what you're into or what turns you on. It's your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or heat things up with your partner. So for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash noise. It's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash noise, dipsystories.com slash noise. One of the chapters in, in of your book that's called "The Light on the Other Side of Divorce," which mm-hmm. we'll we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Um, I think it's called "You Can Create a Life You Love." You know, designing your life by design and not not default. If I if I have that correct, so can you talk to us more about living a life by design versus living it by default? Sure, sure. Um, you know, so many of us wake up and kind of do what we've been doing all along Mm -hmm. (laughs) and just kind of keep doing what we're doing in a, you know, want to call it a frozen state. You want to call it a numbed out state, just in a kind of like robotic way. And we're not necessarily present Mm -hmm. and accepting and mindful and choosing every moment, um, what we want to be doing. And so this is an exercise. that's really just a fun experience, experiential practice of what would be your ideal day. So this is like no holds barred, no money, no money, you know, constraints. Oh, fun. I no love friends. these. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you just kind of write out. And I did this back in the day when I started the healing of my experience from my divorce. And it was really fun to just let my mind roll about what I wanted. And, you know, of course I couldn't, I think it was like, you know, do two hours of meditation and two <laughs> hours of yoga or something like that. Right. And so of course, once I looked at my list, I couldn't do that, but I could do 20 minutes, right? I could. So I start, then you start trying to find ways of just incorporating really your ideal day into your life. And I would say 12 years later, I have that ideal day, actually. Like there's also something, we talk about this in your ability to heal about setting the intention or setting out this desire to have something. And then if you start putting in the small steps, it does end up happening. Okay. So it's kind of like an exercise in manifesting a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, I mean, it's, it's a, it's an exercise in how to change now. Mm -hmm. And I just think that when you change the moment, it ends up changing the future as well. I love that. And it it sounds like a small step in in the direction that that you want to go, which is always, Mm -hmm. which is always fantastic. And, you know, I've, I don't know about you, but so did you either read the book or watch the movie, the secret way back in the day? Yes. I read the book way back in the day. Yep. You read the book. Okay. Yeah. I saw the movie and it's actually a cute story. My, my audience probably knows that about me, but my current husband, which I, I love saying that because it's, you know, kind of keeps him on his toes when I call him a current husband. Uh, but I was, you know, coming out of my own divorce and was, I had sort of drawn a line in the sand and was starting to set some boundaries and it was basically, I'm like, I am going to change my life. And the DVD had just come out and it was one of our first dates. I had casually mentioned in an email to Jason that I don't even know if we were, I think we were just kind of still friends. We were introduced by my sister. And I mentioned that I'm like, there was this DVD that came out called the secret. I want to check it out. Cause I'm, I probably even said in the email, cause I'm going to change my life. <laughs> and he bought it for me. <laughs> it's so sweet. It was just a sweet gesture. And so we ended up watching this 
this movie together. And I've since sort of moved away from the kind of black or white teaching of, well, I shouldn't say sort of, I've definitely moved away from you are responsible for your life based mm-hmm. on your thoughts. Cause there's so many, I mean, it's, that's just so heavily cloaked and, and privileged and doesn't, yeah. doesn't acknowledge systems of oppression and marginalized communities, but I still subscribe a little bit to some of the teachings and on the, I just traveled recently and on the plane ride home, I watched the movie King Richard starring Will Smith. And it's the story of, of Richard Williams and his daughters, Mm. Venus and Serena Williams. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this, but he, he basically manifested (laughs) his Mm -hmm. coaching with them. I mean, this is not to be dismissive at all of the natural immense talent that both Venus and Serena have, but he had a plan all along and just, and I also want to point out the man worked his ass off Mm -hmm. to get these girls the coaching, you know, they moved across the States. It just, of course he, he went to great lengths. It was just such a great example of living life by design versus by default. And I just want to mention this one more thing. I love that. It's just a small step because it doesn't have to be, you know, I'm going to manifest a million dollars by Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the, you know, the manifestation issue with, um, you know, with uh, oppression and, and privilege and, and I'm trained as a cognitive behavioral therapist. And what we essentially believe is that small behavioral changes impact you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And so just thinking today about the way you want your life to be differently naturally makes you make changes today that will lead to that. And so I really want to encourage people when you think that I could never have one of the, one of the um, experiences I've had that has been so powerful for me, powerful for me as a therapist is when clients bring jealousy and envy to me um, about someone else. And I always recommend that they go reach out to that person and say, you know, so excited to hear about your success. Tell me, how did you get there? I'd love to get there with like in the same way. Mm -hmm. And then they are given a blueprint and then they can start following it you know, and sometimes yeah. it works for them and sometimes it doesn't, but shifting this feeling of basically a deprivation model to an abundance model that I can have this. And when you're going through a loss of a job or loss of a relationship or loss of a marriage, like you feel very depleted and very deprived. So anything you can do to tell yourself and help yourself feel like tomorrow I can do one thing that will make my life better than yesterday. That's a huge gift. And mm-hmm. people come to me and they, they really want I mean, we all do, I guess, want a big shift, as you said, like quick, it's not quick. It's small, steady movements over time Mm -hmm. that shift your perspective, your heart, your mind, and your nervous system. Everybody take notes on that, especially that last part, (laughs) write (laughs) that down, back the podcast up and listen to that again. It's so important. And that made me think of uh, what what I did when I went through my divorce, I don't know if I just look back because it happened. So it was 15, 16 years ago. And I don't know if I look back on it because it was sort of a movie moment and maybe I'm romanticizing the moment, but it it felt like I did have a bit of a spiritual experience Mm -hmm. one day where I shifted in retrospect. I think it was sort of like small moments that helped me get to this place, but I was definitely in that place of deprivation. So my husband had an affair, was living a double life for seven months. And the woman that he was his girlfriend was a little bit younger than, than me. She was stunningly beautiful. So it was so easy to fall into that place of I'm not enough. I'm you know now getting older. I'm going to be an, an mm. old spinster. Mm-hmm. What does she have that I don't? Uh, all, that place of lack and, and not enoughness. And also sort of panicking because I wanted more than anything else to be a mother and just, it's never going to happen for me and just felt like a total loser and a failure. And I was on a run. I I ran a lot during that time, probably like bordering on unhealthy. I was on a run in in Carlsbad, Southern California. And there's a, there's a spot, there's, there's some cliffs and there's some spots which could have gone very wrong now that I say the story out loud, but there's this particular <laughs> spot where people, I don't know if they still do, but they would fly there. Um, they were kind of like old school drones. They were these like remote control little airplanes and I stopped and it was such a beautiful day and it was, you know, getting towards the evening. It was like very late afternoon and, and I, I never stop on runs. And for some reason I stopped to look out into the, to the ocean and watch these people fly their planes. And I had a moment of total and utter peace where mm. something said, <laughs> everything's going to be just fine. It's all going to work out. And from that moment, it was 
it was then so much easier to shift and sort of almost like turn my head in completely the other direction and ask myself like, what else is true? Mm-hmm. I might end up single for the rest of my life. I might end up child-free, but what else is true? Like, what are the other possibilities? And and I'm not saying it's that easy to just flip that switch mm-hmm. for people, but I do think that the, the more that we are open to paying attention, and maybe it's this podcast. Well, that, that's what I was going to say, Andrea. Like, were you doing any meditation? Were you doing no. any mindfulness? Were you doing any- just running? And, and I mean, that's definitely could be categorically like right. and were you listening, kind of mindfulness. Yeah. Were you listening to music when you were running? Yes. It was Natasha Bedingfield. The song is unwritten, mm-hmm. which I feel like, come on, <laughs> it had just come mm-hmm. out a few years prior. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. She wrote it for mm-hmm. me. We all know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, so the thing is that you were doing an activity that really connected you to your body and to the present moment. And then you had this realization. I think it's really mm-hmm. important. It's not like you were sitting there on your couch, just having found out, I don't know how, also how long this was after you found out about the affair. Yeah. Right. So it didn't happen right away. I mean, really, you know, in retrospect, we can see how the, how the lines connect, but it's about how the, how the dots connect to be a line, but it's really about putting in the effort. I would say every day for yourself to be on your own side. You know, Mm -hmm. I know we're talking about getting through the ending of something with another person, but this is really about how to, when that happens, be on your own side, put the focus on yourself. I always tell this story that my experience was um, divorcing someone who struggled from a substance use disorder. And I was in the playground. My kids were six months and two years old when I kicked him out. And I was telling some parents were asking me and I was telling the story and they were crying and they were so moved and and I left and I felt terrible. I just was thought like, Oh God, why that was just a terrible, first of all, that was his story to tell. And secondly, like that was awful because that was so painful for me to Mm -hmm. live through through that. And I was actually in central park and there was a, um, like I, this is how I remember it. I'm sure it didn't happen this way as as you said, right. With your story, but you know, like it was, I remember it being like a, a fork in the road. And I just had this moment where I was like, this is the, cho- I have a choice. Like I could spend the rest of my life telling his story and seeing this as like focusing on him. And there was a lot to focus on, or I could gently and lovingly and compassionately focus on myself and lovingly say, you know, baby doll, let's get through this together. Mm-hmm. Let's figure out how you ended up here. Let's figure out how not make sure it doesn't happen again. And let's do this together. And then yeah. that was the moment that it shifted from being about them to being about me. And yes. I think that's the really important piece is the answers are within you, not outside anybody, not with your friends. It's, it's really within you. And so many of us abandon ourselves when we're going through this kind of loss. Yes. I, I want to underscore that so much because that was also part of my kind of spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it is, is, and it felt like such freedom to shift the focus onto myself rather than my soon to be ex-husband at the time and his girlfriend, because I didn't have any control of them. I didn't have any control of what they were going to do. If they were going to keep harassing me, if they were, you know, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And it felt like freedom. It felt like radical freedom, scared, terrifying, Tr- that too, but also mm-hmm. so much freedom. And um, I want to, I want to ask you as, you know, speaking of divorce, you know, for mm-hmm. those people who are listening, who are either going through one or have been through one previously or, or might in the future, what is the long-term impact of divorce that you've discovered for adults, for adults? Yes. Well, it's such a good question. I mean, I would say that it really depends on how you move through the process, the divorce proceedings. And between when you decide you're getting divorced by either accepting someone else's decision or you instigating it. And when you sign the papers is one phase. And so once, depending on how you manage that, as far as how you handle your own feelings, and if you take care of yourself, and as you just said, focus on yourself rather than the other person, then the post the signing of the divorce, your life can be free, open, and joyful. The question really is, what is your perspective? I mean, we've all met people who at a dinner party who've been divorced for 30 years and are still talking about their ex and their resentment. Mm -hmm. So it's really Mm -hmm. the question of the long-term impact is really up to all of y'all. Like it's really about who do you want to put the focus on your long-term impact will be 
sadness, misery, not wanting to be with anyone else. If you focus on the other person, Mm -hmm. you focus on yourself lovingly and compassionately get the help that you need. You have a full next chapter to have whatever kind of joy that you desire. Yes. And which actually leads me to my next question. Maybe think of, of something else about, about believing in our own ability to heal, because I I think that that might be sometimes the step that people don't, don't do. And it's just, cause they're just unconscious about it. Like we just don't like intentionally think about, about our ability to heal. So what are some ways that someone can begin to believe in their own ability to heal, to be able to move forward in their journey, whether it's a breakup or loss Mm -hmm. of a job, et cetera. Mm -hmm. This is a really important piece. You know, we live in a very catastrophe driven world Mm -hmm. where we don't talk about the successes. We talk about the failures. You tell a friend that you're getting a new job and many friends, maybe you know, we'll say like, well, have you thought about this or what about, you know, they kind of, you know, we have this sense that like pointing out the negative is a way to um, prevent crises when really it just inhibits someone from finding their absolute abundance, going back to the deprivation mentality. So you have to understand that we actually have a deep ability to heal. I mean, all research on trauma shows that the resilience is unbelievable. In fact, there's something that is termed post-traumatic growth, the ability Mm -hmm. to grow. One of the cognitive approaches I I recommend to people is really to make a list of all the things that, that you were really struggling. I mean, through, I mean, I think you can remember in high school and middle school, you know, things that you thought were going to crush you that you would never live through again. Um, Endings of friendships, grades, whatever it might be. And like, you might look back and be like, well, that was nothing now, but it was something you, like you felt the same intensity back then oh, that yeah. you feel now. And you, you had the ability to heal. How did you heal? What did you, so really to kind of gather data about your capacity to heal. So that's the first kind of cognitive approach that I would, I would suggest. The second one is to ask other people like, and this is what I have a podcast called the divorce doctor podcast, where I interview people who've gone through divorce and talk about how they've healed. And that's a perfect example to hear other people's experience of how they healed, which will help inspire you about how you can heal. So like surrounding yourself by people who healed, not Mm -hmm. people who are still suffering. And then the last is a hypnotic exercise that I have in my book where you actually imagine your future self. Maybe you've done this with clients, Andrea, where Mm -hmm. you imagine your future self already healed through this. So you don't have to know how you got there, but you know that that person has already healed. And in the visualization, you meet that being and they give you a message and spend time with them. So, um, those are, those are the three ways I would say to, to do that. I love that last one, especially I would have, lo- that would have been helpful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that what I didn't do. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, so I still have my journals from high school. I saw my journals from elementary school, even wow. I have a hello kitty diary from, um, that actually was elementary school and middle school, which is basically just chronicling all the boys I had crushes on and like, like, um, scene by scene from the roller skating rink. It's hilarious. But my high school one, that is literary gold because not because I was a great writer, just, but because I documented the obsessive feelings of love of a 15, 16, 17 year old girl. And what was so interesting to me to read it again was a couple of things. It made me remember what it's like to be a teenager in love. So I can empathize with my, my, they're, they're only 12 and 14. So they're just headed into that very soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I had never put that together though. It's like, look at my, my ability to heal. What did, what did I do? Mm -hmm. There was definitely some unhealthy things that I did, (laughs) which I can look back on now. That that wasn't, that wasn't probably the best way to heal, but it was whatever, you know, it works until it doesn't, as they say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, what, one thing I also did that points to the, your second step was that I made a list because when, when I was going through my divorce and I found myself obsessing on my, well, he was still my husband and his girlfriend is that I made a list. I got out a Sharpie. It was, Mm. I made sure it was a marker and I made a list of all the people that I knew believed in me and Mm. that cared about me and that knew that I could turn to them if I could. And it was a list of about 10 women. And I think my dad was on the list too, but (laughs) I didn't Mm. trust very many men at that point. Sure, but it was, I mean, it was like my therapist and my Mm -hmm. good friends. And um, even my, my soon to be former mother-in-law was on Mm. there because she was still very much kind to me and, and was like a mother to me. And so Mm -hmm. I looked at that list whenever I was like going down that rabbit hole of obsessing on things I couldn't control. And that Mm -hmm. was really helpful. 
I think it's Brene Brown who recommends that you have a list of your like trusted people you can be vulnerable with and mm-hmm. like, keep it in your pocket. And she says something like, if you have one, you're so set. If you have more, if you have three, you're freaking you golden. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, and I think it's, I think you're bringing up a really important point, which is I have this in my book too, about the different kinds of people we need surrounding us. Um, and we talked about how our, our mutual friend Kate is a, a deep cheerleader. And she is really someone who I think of at the highest level of you call to have someone totally on your side. Mm-hmm. Now we also have, there's other different levels. Like there's these one group of people I like to call way showers. Like that's the one who's going to like you, like me, who show you the way of how they healed. Mm-hmm. Then there are these like little fairies that, you know, tell you about a new apartment or tell you about a good school district, right? Like they're, and they're not necessarily going to be your confidant. So it's always right. important to know like, who is your audience? And most importantly, what do you need? Mm-hmm. What do you need? Because we all seem to go to naysayers a lot. Like we know yeah. they're not going to be supportive, but we still go to them. I think psychologically, it's because we feel like if we can convince them, then we're right because they're totally, but it's like who? easier to hold out hope that they're going to show up rather than accept right. that they just accept that they're not and go to mm-hmm. the people who, you know, are going to support you. And so really for anyone going through any sort of grief and loss, please think about who you're talking to. Treat yourself like an angelic, precious baby. Who do you, are you going to hand that baby over to? Mm-hmm. Who do you trust to hand that baby over to you? Or, or mm-hmm. if you don't have babies, like I know some of you are dog owners who <laughs> would only trust very, very few totally. people with your dog. Like who are those people? Totally. Yeah. Okay. So before we close up, I want to ask you, I want to circle back to resentment because, mm-hmm. you know, we, we hear in self-help, like let go of resentment, you know, and especially I think if you've come from any kind of broken relationship, whether it's divorce, a partnership or, or whatever, even friendships, like that we can resent these people. And so do you have like one or two things that you would tell someone listening to change the way they, they look at resentment in the first place or how to process mm-hmm. it? Or, or what would you tell those people yeah. who are really struggling? Yeah. First of all, I hear you. I get it. Like we all have, you know, resentment. And, um, I think it's really, for me, the people I've had resentment for, I have found it so annoying when people say like, just forgive them. Like the word forget as I called it, that yeah. was like the F word for me. I was like, do not get say the F word. Like, again, going back to the righteous anger, like I, I, I have, the, you know, I deserve and have the right to be angry. So that's the first thing I want to say, like, I see you, I hear you. I understand when you're ready to work on resentment, which is usually when you realize that as I think it was, a story about the Buddha, you know, that resentment is taking poison and thinking it's going to kill another person. Mm-hmm. Like when you, when you realize it's actually really hurting you, that's when you can start kind of working with it. And I always recommend starting with this idea that we all have a huge wheel of strengths and weaknesses. So in the book, I have a actual like picture of a bicycle wheel and to kind of write out all the parts of you. Um, like for myself, I am generous and loving and nurturing and I'm intolerant and I'm impatient and I'm mm-hmm. inflexible and I'm rigid, you know, sometimes you can you know, always add the word sometimes. That's not all of who I am. And so I write kind of all of who you are on this, on this uh, bicycle wheel and then write it about the person who you're resentful of, because just like you, they have all different parts of you. And so it was hard at first for me with my ex to think about it, but you know, so I started with the things that I could easily accept and see, which were the negatives. And then I started thinking about, he's funny, he's mm-hmm. curious loving. I just started with a few things. And if you have children, this is incredibly important for those of you who are listening, who do have children. If you have children with your person that you're feeling resentful resentful Mm -hmm. with, because they are 50% them. I mean, even if they're adopted or whatever. So, so you always need to see something in them that is from that other person that is good because that's really important for them because otherwise they're, when you, I mean, we know like the number one, I have a a webinar on my website called uh, how to not screw up your kids, like Mm -hmm. tips from a psychologist. But the number one thing is not to talk smack about the other person. And if you do that, their kids are always thinking like, Oh my God, do they feel this way about me? Cause I I'm a little bit like this too. So the first step is really looking at your wheel and their wheel and having some compassion that we all have our wheels. And then the other one that's harder to do, it's kind of like the next step is realizing that when you have one finger pointing at someone else, three fingers are pointing back at you. So the things that we really don't like about others are usually things we don't like about ourselves. And this is another opportunity to put the focus back on ourselves and help and figure out how we can heal us instead of focusing on the other person. 
I love all that. That was, that was a lot of information in such a short amount <laughs> of time. Go kind of fast. Yeah. This must not be your first rodeo, Dr. Cohen. <laughs> I've talked, to, talked about this a couple of times. <laughs> um, yeah. And I know that, that all of this is in your book and, and yeah. we'll for sure link to that. It's called the light on the other side of, of divorce. And I appreciate your time so much, but before we go, is there anything that you want to circle back to that you want to, or something that you want to make sure that you get in before we tell people where to go and find you? I guess I just want to say that anyone going through a change in a relationship and a job, any sort of grief and loss, you are a superhero. It is so hard. And if you're here listening and stayed this long and really interested in how to make it through so you can heal, that is so brave. So just congratulations to you for sticking this through and being there for yourself and being on your own side. It's really, really impressive. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And you're at drelizabethcohen.com, which will make it easy for people and put that link in the show notes. But is there anywhere else you want people to to go? I know you mentioned you have a, a free webinar on your website. Is there anything else? Yeah. People can find all that on my website. I would just recommend if you want to listen to the Divorce Doctor podcast to get some more healing and stories, inspirational stories about people who move through their divorce, check that out. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. And listeners, thank you so much for your time. I'm so grateful that you choose to spend it with, with me and my guests. And remember it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye for now. Hi there. Swinging back by to say one more thing. You know how I'm always giving advice over here on the show and on social media, and a couple of those things is that I'm always telling you to ask for what you want, be clear about it, and also ask for help. So I am taking a dose of my own medicine, and I'm going to do that right now. It would be the absolute best and mean the world to me if you reviewed and subscribed to this show, Make Some Noise Podcast, on whatever podcast platform of your choice. And even more importantly, It would matter so much if you shared this show. Sharing the show is one of the few ways the podcast can grow, and that also gives more women an opportunity to make some noise in their lives. You can do that by taking a screenshot when you're listening on your phone and sharing it in your Instagram or Facebook stories. If you're on Instagram, you can tag me at HeyAndreaOwen, and I try my best to always reshare those and give you a quick thank you DM. And also, you can tell your friends and family about it. Tell them what you learned. Tell them a really awesome guest that you found on the show that you started following. Whatever it is, I appreciate so much you sharing about this show. 